I sometimes come here? Whenever you like. It's your home, too. There are people here who love you. They look at you and Tina, share with you peace and contentment. Of course. And just think it won't be for this time only. That is, if you will help me keep what we have. If we both try hard to... to protect that little strip of territory that's ours. We can talk about your child. Our child. Thank you. And will you be happy, Charlotte? Oh, Jerry, don't let us ask for the moon. We have the stars. Everybody and welcome to True Stories from Tinseltown. And I have got a treat, treat, treat for you guys today. I have Monica Henried on the on our show, and she is the daughter of Paul Henried. Hello, Monica. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. My pleasure. Nice to be with you. Oh yeah. We were supposed to do this earlier, but there was drilling in New York City, and I tell you, it just reverberates everywhere. But Monica was sweet enough to do it today, and it's nice and quiet and rainy. So amen. Um, you want oh, rain? Yes, I love the rain. Oh, yeah. um, why don't you tell us a little bit? about the documentary you're doing on your dad because I found uh, the more I read about him I, I just didn't know all these things it's fascinating it is fascinating he had quite a remarkable life and quite a remarkable career but to tell you the truth I really think his life was more interesting and more exceptional than any roles that he played which mm-hmm. is kind of Stunning, if you think about it. It is, because a lot of people say they have boring lives. We, I just go to the studio, and I'm there all day and night, and whatever they do. But that's something big to say, because I don't think most people could say that. Most actors and actresses now are in the days of golden age of Hollywood. So you're generally making the documentary to kind of show who your dad, to not kind of, to show who your dad is, and... His fans will learn so much about him. I, like I said, I didn't know half of these things. Fascinating. He he really had an amazing life. And it's funny because I always say he was always in the right place at the right time and in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> so- he had these, these huge, you know, highs and lows in his life. And that's, that's tough on a guy. <laughs> but he you stood. Know. He, you know, he was stood it and he was strong. Yeah. And he... I, I must give I must give a lot of credit to my mother for that. They were together for sixty years. Oh my and... God! I can't even imagine Liesel, yeah. right? Liesel, yes, another great story. But what was interesting to me as I was, you know, looking back because obviously I didn't get to know them when they were young and met in Vienna and started their lives together and so on and so forth. So in sort of researching it out and talking to cousins and people who were around, it was. Uh, it only validated what I knew of her once I was part of the family too, if you know what I mean. You know, yeah. and we never we don't we don't interrogate or question our parents about what their lives were like necessarily. You know, it I mean we're all involved in our own lives, going to school and surviving being a teenager right. and all that kind of stuff. Yes. And then grown ups and we don't go backward. It's not that we don't honor them. It's just, you know, it's time. We just don't have the time to do everything, you know. And it's so disappointing, though, too, you know, because I just want to say my dad died when um, I was 16. And I found out all this all this stuff after he died, that he was an entertainer, that he, you know, I knew none of this. I knew he was an accountant. I didn't know anything else about him. So you knew parts of your dad. An accountant and an entertainer. Yeah, he was both, is- <laughs> both sides of the brain. Both sides. That's amazing. It is. Amazing. Yeah. So tell us about um, your dad's upbringing. Was his dad a baron? I read that somewhere, or is that just a myth? It would, it would be more fair to say that it would be the equivalent of, say, being um, knighted. Mm. He wasn't born into any but he was given a title because of things that he did 
uh, as a banker because he was involved with the Kaiser Franz Josef and the bank that was involved with the Kaiser. So they knew each other. He went to lunch <laughs> with the Kaiser. Hung with the, the Kaiser, Kaiser. yeah. <laughs> with, with the Kaiser. So um, he was, he had done, given the Kaiser some good advice, I guess, let's put it that way, and so did get um, uh sort of a knighthood type of thing. He wasn't a baron. And then, you know, honestly, that's part of why I want to do the documentary. I'd like to tell my father's story correctly Mm -hmm. once from beginning to end without include, I shouldn't say without including, but with clarifying the myth and mythology that goes along with his life and career. Because you can look him up. You'll find People talking about him, people on Facebook, people on all social media, I mean, Wikipedia and IMDb, and you get all of these snippets and different pieces of his life. And I must say, even in his book, it's not 100 percent. It's just bits and pieces. And so you're I just I just would like to tell the story once correctly from beginning to end and and then go from there. And you're the person to do it. Who could do well, it better? <laughs> Listen, I've, I've been, you know, I don't want to say fighting this, but I have been fighting this all my life because the first question I get from people when I do uh, film festivals or go out and um, do Q&As for my father's films or introduce my father's films, whatever, the first question is always, what was it like being the daughter of Paul Henry? What was it like growing up in Hollywood? And I think to myself, you know, as a, as a joke, I said to somebody one day, you know what, I'm going to make a... Uh, documentary about this whole thing, and I'm for twenty four ninety five. You'll know everything there is to know. So it kind of started out of humor, but I realized at some point it's it's the best way to do it. Just tell the story once, and then let everybody have all the information. Then there it is, you know. Because, like I said, you know, I read he's a baron. I read all these different things, and. You're here to clear that up because now I know I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, well, whoever wrote it was wrong. I don't know who wrote it. But um, so your dad uh, was born in Trieste, right? Yes, that is correct. And he had his mom and dad. And tragically, his father died when your dad was nine. Yes, correct. He also had a younger brother. Oh. So he, he did have a brother. Yes. And... So that that must have been horrible for him to lose his dad at that age. At any age, it hurts, no matter even if you're older. But when you're a kid, it's so confusing and weird, and you don't really understand the concept. It, it completely changed his life and the lifestyle that they were accustomed to living, and it, it literally changed everything, everything. Financially, obviously, emotionally, all that stuff. Well, back in those days, you know, certainly in the middle 19 teens, no woman was possibly capable of, you know, keeping a, a checkbook balanced or her family affairs in order. Right. So the, yeah. the the uncles took over and uh, there were some that were, <laughs> how do you talk about family? There were some who were nicer than others. Yes. There were a few who were uh, quite... Um, controlling, and one of the controlling ones it literally was the uh, was the one who took over, and so they they had to move from where they were living. They were no longer living in the night lifestyle they were accustomed to. They switched schools. My grandmother and the two boys moved out of Vienna to get close to her parents to feel more sense of connection again. And yeah, when he went to school you know, in a little tiny town and where yeah, did they I, move to? Where was your, where was your mom's mom? My, your grandma, grandmother's family. Yes. What lived, um, at least part time in, uh, or just on the outskirts of a town called Krems, which is on the Danube. But it's about, I mean, even now today, a train ride is about an hour. So it, it was quite a ways out of Vienna. Yeah. And it must have been hard for him because he had to give up all his school pals and everything he had known. And Absolutely. But at least Absolutely. he had his grandma there, too. You know, so I'm sure she loved him and, and helped with that. So he basically... To be, honest, he, he, to be honest with you, I don't know because I never, ever heard him talk about that. That's something. You know, parents didn't. They didn't talk about that. I think 
the younger parents now, maybe they do. But I don't think just like when we were teens, we don't like, I don't want to hear it when I'm a teenager, when anyone's a teenager, they're like, oh, be quiet, mom and dad, you know, <laughs> leave me alone. I don't care. You know, and that whole thing happened. So that's funny. He never told you, but yeah. he met your mom in that town or at school in, or in Vienna. In Vienna. Ultimately, he, he the family did move back to Vienna. He and, he and his brother and mother moved back to Vienna, and he got into a the very, very elite school, the Theresiano, which was um, just the best of the best. And it was, again, mostly because of the position that his father had held. Mm-hmm. And even though he was deceased, still because it was the bloodline, he was allowed to go to this school. And that, that school, an all-boys school at that time, would have parties and dances with the all girls school. So my parents actually met when they were probably in their teens without becoming friends or getting to know each other particularly well. And then once my father had established or was beginning to establish his career as an actor in the theater, um, there was an after opening night party uh, and that he attended with, with a blind date. He didn't even want to go, but he was going along as an extra guy to be with a friend's you know the girl for the extra date kind of a <laughs> the third wheel. I, yeah, I don't even explain that, but yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, and um, he saw my mother across the room, and they ended up chatting, and then they realized they had met before, and she was there with a date she didn't particularly care for, and then he decided that he had to leave, and she said, "Well, I'll take you and your date. You know, I'll drop you off at home." And my mother, being brilliant, always and forever dropped off her date, dropped off his date, and drove to the top of the Kobenzl, which is a beautiful, magnificent hillside above Vienna. And they danced, and they drank champagne, and they talked, and never realized that the sun was coming up. And from that day forward, we're never separated. How romantic. You said that, that this story was much more romantic than any of the romantic girls he did. And that happened, and they stayed married 60 years. That is yeah. so amazing. We were together 60 years. It amazing. is amazing. Well, and, he he, he really hit the jackpot because his own family, his mother and his uncles, didn't understand him at all. I mean, their opinion of an actor was, you know, there we've never had one in the family, and we're not going to start now. Didn't someone kind of laugh in his face or something when he said he wanted to be an actor, one of the family no, members? No, no. No, no, no. This family was much too serious. They would never laugh. laugh. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that, that isn't who they are at all, which again, which is why my mother was such a blessing, because her family was all artists and poets and writers. Her father was the director of the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna for 30 years. So it was all about art and the arts and performance and music and dance and so on and so forth. So when he, when he wanted to pursue his career, he now had this new family around him that was completely supportive where his own yeah had never yeah really 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 lucky that he was and you know when you don't have that kind of thing and you have the serious family it must be like this big hallelujah that you meet this wonderful woman you fall in love and she has this fabulous family that loves you that are fun and that understands you he hit the double jackpot there Absolute jackpot. Yep. Um, so he then was on the stage, right, with Max Reinhardt? Did he? He was his protege? Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say protege, but he was part of the original. Uh, I shouldn't say even original, but he was part of the. Uh, Reinhardt had a, a, a theater company and a sort of an academy for actors. Mm-hmm. And the father had auditioned for him and did get into that. Um, group yes yes was Henny Lamar in that one too no not not that one not that Mm-mm, oh no. so he got into that and then um didn't they want him he he got into film and they always wanted or was that in England that they wanted him to always play a Nazi no he well <laughs> um he got into film because he spent some time in the south of France and was seen by some producers and got into these bit parts because he was tall and good looking and they kind of liked that. Very. I didn't know he was so tall. Six foot three. Oh, yeah. Six three, yeah. And then back in Vienna when he was doing theater, um, again, he's very photogenic. And uh, they discovered that luckily at an early age with him and, and he was in his mid-20s and, and uh, 
he got small parts in some Austrian films. Yes, yes, he did. That's I mean everything's everything started for him in Vienna. His and, his career, his the love of his life, his passion for everything, food, cars, everything. It all started in Vienna. And then he was that the first. Where did he get his first blacklist from? <laughs> Well, he, he because he was doing well uh, in movies in Austria, um, a scout from Ufa had seen him and offered to uh, have him come to Berlin to look at the studio and meet the people and so on and so forth. And, of course, by then it was pretty much uh, becoming a propaganda machine yeah. and Goebbels was there and so on. So I think he was very interested in the contract. It would have been great for his career. Um, but in order to do that, you had to be a member of the National Socialist German Actors Guild, and, and that wouldn't be something he would ever sign. So what they then did was just said, no, you're not working in, in any German language film, period. Period, meaning Austria or Germany or wherever. So that was really the first time he was blacklisted. And so then he moved. Uh, Conrad well, Veidt had something to do with it, or Veidt. I love well, him. What a wonderful actor. Yeah, but yes, but no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but no. Um, he, he went, he, he obviously, after this little Berlin experience, he went back to Vienna. He continued in theater because he felt that even if the, the, the Nazis could touch film, which they were certainly trying to turn into propaganda for themselves, um, they wouldn't be able to touch the theater. So he thought he was safe in the theater. And then he got an offer to go to England to do a play which he did and he enjoyed and then went back to Vienna and did some more theater and then was invited back to England again to do another couple of plays. And so he he became um, comfortable with going to England and coming back. And by 1938, it was obvious that, that he had, they all had to get out of Vienna. So he accepted a job in, in London, and that really was the, the kickoff to his career. So um, he and your and mom went to London. He went first. My mother had had shops. She was a couturier designer and costume designer. And um, he went first and sort of established a household. And then mm -hmm. he came and ultimately they brought her parents over and uh, the staff and so on and so forth. And that was working well until England got more involved in the war. And then he became classified as an uh, enemy alien first class. How and weird. Ah. Well, he's an Austrian, uh -huh. and after the was by extension, an, uh, a German, and then ultimately perceived to be, well, if you're a German and you're a Nazi, and so he was, you know, first blacklisted because he wasn't a Nazi, and the second time he was blacklisted because they assumed he was a Nazi, and um, my parents were going to be separated, either deported or sent to uh, detention camps, and by incredible luck and goodwill and so on and so forth that didn't happen and that's what brought him to the united states and that's more or less where where connie got involved because he had already established himself as an actor in london and and my father and the fights were were friends he was great he played that horrible nazi sadorty. he was such a good actor um yeah, he, was. he was sensational They're underrated i mean i wish there was a whole flurry a big festival just for his films because his performances range so far and so deep he was a wonderful wonderful actor wasn't he in the uh, cabinet of dr caligari yeah. yes that's <laughs> what i thought he was so good in that and he was just a kid he was actually very handsome um i thought <laughs> <laughs> there, there's photographs of him when he was young that are absolutely gorgeous yeah, he, I'm sure he was a hunk and a half. So your dad got to Hollywood. Yes. He set himself up. Your mom was with him this time because they could not, she couldn't stay in England, right? They all had to right. kind of leave at the same time. Yes, correct. And did he, how did he get into uh, the movie studios in Hollywood? Well, again, through the theater. He was doing a play on Broadway and um, wonderfully ironic. Well, again, here is a perfect example of him being in the right place at the right time. When he was appearing in the play on Broadway, a film he had made in London 
the previous year called Night Train to Munich happened to also open a block and a half away. So his name was on two marquees simultaneously. Pretty cool. <laughs> Pretty cool. From unknown <laughs> person to person with his name on two marquees on Broadway. You know, That's amazing. Stunning, yeah, pretty stunning. So he became very visible, and and again, it was a, a scout or a producer from RKO Psalm and brought him, helped him come to Hollywood. And he was tall and handsome and photogenic. And I'm trying yes. to look at what his first part in Hollywood was. Joan uh, of Paris. I love that movie. He was a freedom <laughs> fighter, right? She, he was. He was great, and I really liked that movie. It made me cry. Yeah. <laughs> The ending made me cry. Um, And then, this is the one I know and love your father from the most. Now Voyager. Other people say Casablanca, but I loved Jerry and (laughs) Camille Beauchamp. I love him so much. By the the way, you're not alone. (laughs) (laughs) I just love that movie. And they were so great together. They were. um, They were. I have to ask you this, because this is also the big thing, the big old two cigarette thing. So Uh, many, do you know how many people have taken credit for that? (laughs) Do you know? I think the director took credit for, I know your father said he did it on his own, which I believe that's the true story. But the director, uh, I think Betty, you know, the the, uh, cameraman, I don't know, so many people took credit for that. But it was fabulous. Here we go again, because this is all the myth and mythology. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. uh, long after the fact, uh, I mean, after now Voyager existed, um, I would watch my parents do exactly that motion because that's something that came from them. It came from him. I mean, my father loved, I, I mentioned it a little bit, but he loved cars. So the opportunity to take a road trip in my mother's car was like the greatest thing in the world in 1933, 1944. So they would cruise. They would take a day trip out of Vienna just to, to go down the river or go to the lake country or something like that. And all of those cars, of course, were all standard transmissions. So if some, if whoever was driving mm-hmm. wanted a cigarette, the person in the navigator seat would light to simultaneously and pass one over to the driver. It didn't matter if my mother was driving or if my father was driving. It was just something that was in their habit. That's what they did. That's how they took care of each other. They loved each other and so on. So when my father came home that day, when they had, and I, let me go backward again a minute. In the book, in the Prouty book, now Voyager, it does She does describe this action of sharing cigarettes, lighting two cigarettes, not the way they ended up doing it, but sharing two cigarettes. Mm -hmm. That's how it was translated into the script, into the original script. So it reads fine. It reads charming. It reads wonderfully. But when it came down to actually physically going through all the motions as written, it was awkward. It was all arms and cigarettes and hands in the face. And I mean, it just it just didn't. It didn't work. It wasn't romantic. (laughs) It just didn't work. Right. I mean, there are certain physical pieces of business that you use in theater or in film that work very Mm -hmm. well that don't work in real life and vice versa. Yeah. So he, my father, after this sort of frustrating day, mentioned to my mother that night, you know, this is such an awkward piece of business. And my mother literally said, well, why don't you just do what we do? He went on the set in the morning. He explained it to Betty. He did it for Betty. She loved it. They took it to Irving Rapper, who was the director. He hated it, absolutely hated it. Betty, in her glory and wisdom, went over his head and called Hal Wallace, who was the producer on the film. Hal Wallace came and saw it, thought it was genius and brilliant and beautiful the way they handled it. And loved it so much that he actually had the writer, Casey Robinson, put that piece of business into the film a few more times. Yeah, that it was, was not. Oh. It was only in the script once originally. It worked. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. They look at each other. They smoke. The, the last part is the one that makes me laugh, kind of. You know, shall we just have a smoke on it? And then he does his business. They both take... A, a, take it in and then they blow smoke in each other's face while they're looking at each other. So beautiful. Oh, 
It's so beautiful, so cute. And I don't know how they don't cough. I'm like, I'm amazed. Why aren't they coughing? But it is. They were both both smokers as well. Oh, my goodness. Betty's never without. Whenever I I do a lot of pictures on my website and on my um, Facebook page, and she is never without a cigarette. She's in the bathtub. She's got a cigarette. Yeah. Yeah. I I remember it well. um, And so then he, after he made Now Voyager... And I love that movie. And um, he made a couple with Betty, but we'll get back into that. And also with Claude Rains, he was supposed to shoot Casablanca right away, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good, good, I'm correct on that one. <laughs> yeah, completely yes. correct. Okay. So at first, he wasn't too crazy about doing Casablanca. Is that correct? No. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And of course, ironically, it turned out that he was, he was, right at the time Mm -hmm. history has proved him wrong (laughs) but at the time it was um it it did not work in his favor and he knew it wouldn't so that's why he hesitated but he did get his his agent to negotiate a better deal in in the original um play um you don't really see victor laszlo there's a lot of conversation about him but you don't meet him and in the film, I think in the original few pages that were written, that was implied also. And my father said, first of all, I don't want to, it's going to hurt my career to play the second man in this film. And uh, if you want me in it, you, you, you have to bolster the part. You have to make it make sense that you have to understand his relationship with her, her relationship with him kind of a thing. Yeah. So, and, and he asked that to please have his name you know, above the title, which was indeed in his original contract. So he did get it. And it was so it was Bogart, Ingrid and him. It was Bogart, Ingrid and your dad above the title yeah. or just Bogart? Okay. And your, well, it no, had to be Ingrid there, as well. It was the three of them. It was the three of them. But he knew he knew instinctively that that was going to hurt his career. And it did. So but, you know, and then that leads to other things, like ultimately he became a writer and a director and a producer, and he learned how to put films together on his own, and he learned to fight for getting things done. And, you know, if he had just stayed with being a leading man, per se, in these in these lovely films, I think he maybe wouldn't have had the opportunity to play some of the other characters that he really enjoyed playing and wanted to play. I mean, he went head-to-head with Jack Warner. I can't tell you how many times he was suspended at Warner Brothers because he would go head-to-head with Jack about these leading, these, what I forget the word he used, but sort of the the implication of these fluffy leading men who really <laughs> weren't terribly... They weren't terribly interesting. They didn't. Now, I'm not talking about either Victor Laszlo or Jerry Durant. I'm talking about what came after. And uh, I he, he wanted. I'm sorry. You know, he wanted, he wanted to be a swashbuckler. He wanted to be uh, the villain. He wanted to do all of these things. And and Jack Warner absolutely said no. We. You have to be uh, the dreamboat. You have to be the leading man. He did another with Betty. He did Devotion. Devotion was with Ida Lupino. Oh, Deception. And- Deception with yes. Betty. And yes. um, I love that movie, too. Yes, I do, too. I think it's <laughs> fabulous. I think Betty's great. They had a it- nice... She and he had a nice rapport. And with Claude Rains, um, they... That's, the, in truth, that film belongs to Claude Rains. Oh, he, he owned he, it. Yeah. He chewed the scenery like nobody else's business. I mean, he was absolutely, and I mean that in a good way. I know some people think that's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. But the three of them, you know, if, the the three of them playing off of each other and uh, knowing each other's character and dynamics and so on and so forth. I mean, they the three of them were just sensational together. They were. I love that. I think um, I talked, I know you're friends with Jessica Rains, and I talked to Jessica a couple times. I adore her. She is so down yeah. to earth and fun. Yeah. I love her to pieces. Yeah. And she said, that's her favorite movie as well that her dad did is, de- is um, Deception. Deception. Devotion. Yeah. De- Devotion was the one about the Bronte sisters, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So he want I can't, you know, your father wanted to be a swashbuckler. Yeah, everything. He, I mean, he, he was a thoroughly trained actor. Uh, he had been in a, a theater academy at the conservatory 
prior to him even going with Max Reinhardt. So he, he knew how to do, he was trained to do everything. If Fencing, it was, yeah. Or, or horseback riding or singing or dancing or whatever it was. He, he was trained to do it all. And that was part of his joy of being an actor was to spread his wings, to stretch himself, to see how far could he take a character or a characterization and always finding the, you know, the, the truth and who that character was. So that was very important to him. He, he really wasn't interested in being caught up uh, in a cliche, uh, you know, in a pigeonhole in a specific type of role, which is also why he, he said yes to playing a couple of the Nazi roles that he ended up playing because he, having experienced that time and both in or in Vienna and in Berlin and in London, he knew that they were not just heavy handed thugs. They were very uh, educated, charming men and it was uh, and, and women. So for him, he could see that people would get caught up in in being in their company because they they were capable of it was a seduction. You know, it it wasn't just you will do this, but it was a, you know, there was a a slinky, slimy, but charming way that they moved about. So he was willing to do that because he wanted to show that side of of those characters. Yeah, it's well, he was not typecast, that's for sure, because he broke the mold after doing that. Like you said, he wanted to do the other things. He was never typecast in any role from what I'm looking at all of his work he's done. Um, He worked with Katherine Hepburn, and he liked her a lot, right? Yes. 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 Again, true dedicated professionals always caught his attention. <laughs> I'm sure there are ones that weren't, that he didn't like too much either. You you could trust me. You could tell me mine. <laughs> what? You the what? ones he didn't like. I'm sure there are ones he didn't like, too, because they were not professional and whatever. But you don't have to tell me. We'll just well, but there were There were definitely those that he didn't care for uh, both professionally and personally that he worked with and then you have people like Kate who he did like to work with and did enjoy as a person and the same with Betty who he liked very much both professionally and personally and 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 never to leave out my mother because again it was the th- always the three of them together in the living room until the wee hours talking about life and love and family and children and all the rest of that goes along with that they were great friends Catherine is great friends, and Betty was great friends with your dad. Yeah, Betty, definitely. Kate, I don't remember being in the house all that much because that was a whole other that was a whole other thing. But they appreciated each other professionally and enjoyed each other's company. Yes, but Betty was often at our house, and we were often at hers. Did you guys live on that bus line of the Hollywood tours? Do you know how they take the tourists would go to see the houses of the of the stars? Yes. You did. Wasn't that weird? Yes. You're growing up and these people are gaping at your house every day, yeah. <laughs> three times was, a day or something. It was even more ridiculous when the would. I do remember a day. I think I was in my early teens, and my father and I were either just leaving or just coming back. And we had a big gate that you had to open to get onto the property. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that you couldn't see through a big solid wooden gate. And the bus had pulled up behind us. And my father was trying to rather quickly, I I don't know, whatever it was. And the bus driver said, yelled at him. He says, oh, is Mr. Henry at home? Oh, they didn't even know who he was. (laughs) No, my father said, no. That's, no, he's not here. That's so <laughs> creepy. And it's so stupid they didn't even know who he was. But, I mean, all the time, uh, people just gaping, gaping, yeah. gaping. Did you know, lived, huh? Where'd you live? We lived in a very, um, I, I guess, celebrity-dense neighborhood. So these drivers were, I think, amused by it all. Dory Sherry, who was the head of MGM, lived around the corner. Arthur Rubenstein lived at the top of the street. Pat O'Brien, uh, Betty Hutton, Judy Garland, Wow, Fred Murray, Rita Hayworth. Um, there was there were a bunch. <laughs> you had the you what a life. So you, I have to ask you, was your dad strict with you as a child? You, I know you had a sister Mimi as well. Was he a strict dad? Um, I I don't really. He he set certain standards, 
um, and and we were expected to live up to them. Let me put it that way. I don't. I'm not really sure what strict means in that respect. You know. I mean, I think if you look at the, you know, if you if you want to compare him to Mommy Dearest, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, but but yes, we had to behave in a certain way, and we had to dress in a certain way, and we there were there were rules, and there were uh, expectations, and we had to live up to them. Yeah. Definitely. Um, did you? And that was that was old. That was sort of the older, um, sort of aristocratic patterns that that he had come from. Old world rules, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, did you ever meet Christina Crawford? I know <laughs> Jessica met her once. Did you? And she met Joan. I. I it's it, it's funny. I I don't actually remember a hundred percent, but I do remember going to Joan Crawford's apartment in new york as a child because we were supposed we were indeed the children and my sister and i were supposed to have a play date and um i i just i don't remember the kids at all they're the twins <laughs> the twins very polite of me at all. what i remember was stepping into the apartment not being allowed off the foyer level so it was there were nannies it's not to say we were alone ever but there was sort of a step down, and you could see into the living room, and everything was covered in plastic. Oh, my God. Made-to-order fitted plastic. Oh, my God. Over. Well, at least she had designer <laughs> plastic. Thank God. It <laughs> was horrible. the opposite of the way we were in our yeah. house. We had we had a big house, but it was open and comfortable, and nobody ever felt really ill at ease other than, you know, being in awe of my father. <laughs> I mean, you could come in, you could sit down on any chair. There was open French doors to the front porch that overlooked the rose garden to the side, which overlooked the swimming pool. I mean, it was easy. It was comfortable. It was comfortable. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, plastic, funny. plastic yeah, it was, stuff. There was nothing plastic about my upbringing at all. Yeah. None. Well, um, I'll, okay, well, let's talk about what happened to your dad when he got, he was, there was the Hollywood 10, and your dad went with a bunch of other actors and actresses, with Lauren Bacall, Humphrey Bogart, Danny yeah. Kaye. They went to Washington. Your father stood he heads and tails above them all. He was so tall. <laughs> every, you know, the other ones look so short. And um, that got him into some trouble. This yep. was a horrible time. This was yeah, just a horrible exactly. time. Blacklisting, communism. It, it was just unbelievable. Yeah, that was the Committee for the First Amendment, uh, who, as you say, flew to Washington to support um, the writers and the people who were then being accused of being communists in Hollywood, et cetera, and so forth. He never actually um, made a court appearance or anything like that, but he was, he, they were all there in support of it. Uh, and then it raveled, it started falling apart because uh, some of the people who were, and I put the word accused in quotes, the, who were accused of being communist actually were, did believe in the communist system, yeah. which of course, gigantic no-no at that time. And uh, just, just, you know, guilt by association. And he couldn't understand why he would be blacklisted because he wasn't a communist, even though he 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 knew a lot of these people because he's in Hollywood. You work with each other. You know, the writers and directors and actors all work together. So um, anyway, he never thought that he would be blacklisted. And he came back to Hollywood and found out that all of the studios, all of the major studios had blacklisted him. So he could not work in Hollywood with any of the majors for five years. Wow. Well, what about the others? I know that um, who, I was talking to a Hollywood historian, and he said, why wasn't Humphrey Bogart blacklisted? Because he went there, and the others were blacklisted, and he said that Bogart kind of stepped back from He's, that. He definitely yeah. He stepped back and he wrote a letter, and he put it. In, they interviewed him and put it in magazines that he didn't know, and uh, he didn't know that these people actually were com complicated times, yeah. you know, very complicated times. Yeah. But he, he and and to be honest, he was an American mm. and my father wasn't true. So true. He had, he, had, he had become an American citizen by then. Yes. But he, he wasn't considered an American. 
you know. So um, I don't think very many were. I know a lot of writers were and directors. And what I really hated was when I read about the people who testified against people they worked with and all the, you know, it was just like, I, I, I don't understand you guys. How could you do that to me? Yeah. How creepy. Hor- You're ruining someone's career and life. Yeah, hor- horrible and and really just despicable times. Yes. And so he was blacklisted from the studios for five years. Yes. And then he started acting again. But he kept he kept working. He didn't he didn't stop working. He no, just I couldn't see. see the managers. He was he was uh, and again, had this not happened to him, then the next step of his career wouldn't have happened. He was then offered to do independent filmmakers, both in America and in Europe, specific, most specifically England, um, offered him these other films and to keep going and because of his own integrity and his own you know, philosophy about you know pursuing your career and taking being responsible for your family and so on and so forth he took these other films and again learned a lot about independent filmmaking and there was a company that was forming in the states and they gave him they actually they came to him and said look we can't give you your full salary we're going to give you maybe half your salary and then let you be we'll call you a producer and then when we if the if the film makes money you'll get a certain percentage of it and by then he knew enough about you know the accounting and how all that stuff works and he said okay I'll do that it ended up those three maybe four films he made more money making those than he did on either Casablanca or Now Voyager. Wow. Possibly Now Voyager and Casablanca combined, he made more than that. And so again, it was a learning process. He was involved from the beginning. And out of, you know, and again, out of that come films like Hollow Triumph. And actually, I think Hollow Triumph came before that. And um, it was. Some noir it, stuff. He did some noir. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's again, it's being in the right place at the right time and the wrong place at the wrong time. And learning how to ride with the wave, so to speak. And again, thank goodness, his luck was that my mother was there right next to him. She would never, ever let him give up. She always encouraged him. She always told him it would get better or it would get back to normal. She always was the one to stand there and say, come on, let's let's be smart about this. Let's move ahead. Let's make a good. And it was always we. It was never I or you. They were a team. They were a real team. Well, luckily, she had, in her career also, there were times when she was making the money and holding him up. And right. most after, I mean, once she came to California, she just decided for the most part she wanted just to to be, you know, a, a mom and, and run the house and so on and so forth. And again, very luckily, she had phenomenal taste and uh, people adored her. I still run into kids because... At, once we were into the 1950s and my father was doing all these independent things, she started um, dance classes, cotillions, like they have in Europe that she had gone to as a, as a child. They wear the where, white gloves. <laughs> you wear the white gloves. Yeah. Very, you don't just learn how to dance. You learn good manners and you learn how to interact with the opposite sex and so on and so forth. And it, it was a very it was a very interesting um, thing that she chose to do. And so she was making money doing that also because it was teaching cotillions and and trophy balls and all the celebrities would come because all the kids of the celebrities were part of it. And so, I mean, it was, again, it was them shifting back and forth, figuring out how to make things work. But and how, how lucky did, um, they were so much of a team. Uh, did you and your sister ever feel left out or was it more, uh, do you know what I mean? Sometimes people think that their parents are, as an example, and I'm not saying anything like your mother and father were like them, because I'm sure they weren't. Nancy Reagan and Ron, Ronald Reagan, their kids felt left out because they were so much of a team that they felt that their parents weren't as much into them as they were just concentrating on that team. Well, I can't obviously speak for my sister, but I can tell you for me, I was never I never felt left out. We were they were very supportive of anything we did. My sister was a great athlete. And we would go to all of her tournaments and all of her events. She was a parents. tennis pro, right? That's right. And and she was a national junior champion. And 
we went to all sorts of tennis events and tennis tournaments. We spent summers on tour with her. It was great. I mean, we went, our family holiday became this wonderful tour of tennis tournaments. So, and, and for me, you know, we would go to the opening of the ice capades and the ice follies and the opera and so on. And lucky for me, there was a point where my mother just was exhausted and didn't want to go to any more premieres and things like that. So I became, when I was about 12, I started to sort of become my father's date. <laughs> fun. No, you must have had so much fun. I got to go to all the premieres with him and, and, uh, Again, you know, all the sporting events and so on. So it was, it, for me, it was absolutely wonderful because I love the arts. I love the ballet. I love concerts and opera and so on and so forth. So, no, I don't, I don't think we were left out. I certainly never felt left out. But again, I can't, I can't answer for my sister. I think that's good. You know, that they, you, then you were a nice family unit. They were supported of you and all that. Who was your dinner, dinner was a family deal. Seven o'clock, you were clean, you were in clean clothes, you showed up at dinner and you had the dinner conversations and the food was always spectacular. So it was a it was a nice thing to be able to do. The only times that we didn't all eat together was if my father was late at the studio from the studio or uh, if he was out of town on location. But the rest of the time, dinner was all of us together. That's very important. People don't do that anymore. That's a shame. I love the whole dinner bit, the proper dinner. And mm -hmm. it's so much fun. And it's nice and it's good for everybody. You reconnect, talk about your day, do all that stuff. So when you went on, you went with your dad on all these things. Who was your favorite celebs? Oh, I, did you? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. I, I love Betty because she was, she was there. She, that was sort of a hands-on relationship. I literally knew her well my whole life. I mean, when I was starting my career, she was very supportive of me. And, and, uh, when I had moved to New York, she was in New York and, and, you know, she was just a great friend. She was like extended family, you know, so certainly Betty is the top of that list. I don't, I don't know. I'm not very, um, celeb conscious. Yeah. I, I know for me, because I've been there too. I mean, it's a job. Yes. You know, I mean, I, I there are some people that I would be inclined to admire more than actors. <laughs> yeah. I know what you mean. Because yeah. Jess I, Jessica I, said, I, it's like, you know, I didn't care. They were just people I grew up with every day, you know, and exactly. are seen, and it was like no big deal to me. Exactly. exactly. They were our Smiths and Joneses. They were our neighbors. They were yeah. the people that borrowed the cup of sugar from. You know, there was, it was no big deal about it at all. And they, at one point or another, there were a lot of celebrities who were at our house that they would come over the weekend by the pool and, and you know, whatever. I it just... I never really paid attention that they were celebrities. They were either nice or they weren't. Yeah, <laughs> they were just either creepy people or nice people. You know, that's it. Yeah. Um, so then your dad became a director, Mr. Multifaceted Dude. <laughs> yes. And he did Dead Ringers. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Dead Ringer, which is such... When I saw that he directed this, this was years ago, um, and I, you know, I look it up on IMDb, and years ago I saw that you were his daughter, and I found that movie, and like I said, sometimes I can't watch it. I'll start watching it, and it's... Like, the jet, the music was amazing, because it yeah, br brings okay. that tension, that jazz, yeah. that yeah. non-ending jazz. Huh? You know, Andre Previn, you can't beat it. You it know, was unbelievable was, because yeah, it, it was great. It brought the tension, and me, I'm like, oh, I can't take any more of the same jazz song. But it was perfect. And then they did like this creepy <laughs> music. <laughs> I loved it. What was it yeah. like working with your dad and Betty? And there was a cute. I put a picture on um, my Facebook page of you and your dad's wearing his glasses and you, during the movie. So you're looking at the mm -hmm. script and you were probably right. asking him some stuff. Right. How yeah, is that? that? That's on his Facebook page too. We have an official fa Facebook page for him as well, and so and well, all the rest of them, <laughs> Instagram and Twitter and all that. So yes, I know exactly what what picture you're talking. I love about. that picture. It's very cute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, 
So it was great working with him, and it that wasn't the first time. And uh, again, here we go with the myths of it all. They there's I, I have a lot of press clippings that say that was my first film. It wasn't my first film. They say it was the first time working with my father. It wasn't the first time working with my father. So you know, I I grew up. Luckily, uh, he and I got along very well when we got along very well, and we argued pretty well too. We argued pretty fair. We were pretty good at it. And uh, it was it was great working with him because he is, you know, the consummate professional. He knows exactly what he wants out of his actors. He knows exactly what he wants out of his cameraman. He's he's well rehearsed. I mean, I remember so many evenings when I would have liked a little help with my homework that he was actually in his office with the doors closed doing his homework. He was planning whatever was going to be the next day, whatever was being on you know shot the next day whatever scenes would be if i was in it or not that's irrelevant it's when he was directing television um you know, it was it was it was great it was great working with him it was great working with her it's always good when you work with professionals i had the opportunity to work with people who were not <laughs> not <laughs> Were you in Girls on the Loose or Live Fast Die Young? I know that was one of the one of those movies you're in, right? Yeah. It, <laughs> that was that was so long ago. Thanks for bringing that up. Well, I'm just trying to prove your point that, that you did a that, movie before <laughs> Dead Ringer. Yeah. Ringer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. And and then there was some television in between. Oh, you were so. in the Terror in Teakwood, right? Yes, I was. I'm trying to think because I've watched all the thrillers, and I can't remember which one that is. I'm going to watch it later because I can find it on YouTube. Because well, that's where where one pianist is jealous of another dead pianist's hand. Oh my goodness, I love that one. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Oh, I'll watch it. <laughs> I'm going to watch that tonight. You were also uh, you did some. Uh, you did like a 70s TV movie, didn't you? You do those kind of things as well. And with your dad, I'm seeing, I can't believe how much he, how often he directed Alfred Hitchcock Presents. 29 episodes. Amazing. Did he know yeah. Hitch, Hitchcock and were they pals or, you know, he must have respected your dad to have him do 28 episodes. That's amazing. Yeah. Yes, Absolutely. Um, th yes, they knew each other. Were they pals? I don't think pals is applicable to mm -hmm. Hitch, but um, yeah, they definitely knew each other and they did know each other socially as well. But again, there is a tremendous respect back and forth between two professionals. Yeah. And, to, you know, to, to do that, I can't, I'm just looking at all this in my notes um, I can't get over all, you, you taught me so much stuff and it's so funny be, you know, because like you said this documentary has to be out there because you you dispel myths you're putting out the truth I saw yeah. um, um, on YouTube you can catch uh, some of the trailers Monica is, is um, narrating you have a great voice to narrate this thing. Oh, thank you. That's it, really, it really is. And then some other guy was narrating, and I said, "Where's Monica?" I don't like his. No offense, <laughs> other guy, but I didn't like his voice. I said, "I want Monica to narrate." I don't like this guy. So we we have to do that for the documentary because I don't think you can sit for an hour and a half and just listen to me. You know, I, <laughs> but it's not really yeah, that no, because you're showing I, clips and things I, like I that. Appreciate, I appreciate the compliment. However. I think there are, yes, we're showing clips, and, and yes, we have fabulous interviews. I mean, just absolutely fabulous interviews with people who work with him, all of whom have uh, different relationships. So they all have different stories to tell, which was just great. And I didn't realize until I really got 10 of them, the, the primo primos that I really wanted, that three of the people who were willing to be interviewed for this our Kennedy Honors recipients. I, that blew me away. <laughs> That's went, a big oh. honor. Who? That's huge. That's huge. It was Norman Lear, uh -huh. Richard, not, I'm sorry, Norman Lear, Zubin Mehta, and uh, Rita Marino. Oh, yeah. She was in that. Yeah. You know, I thought your father directed that movie. Rita, wasn't that her first film she did with your dad? She was, was in that movie? That, that was the first one where she had a, a principal part, yes. 
Yeah. Indeed. She was and, very and, good. And he played a, like a guy who came in to reform this girls' reform school. Correct. I love that movie. And they had so many people. I think Ann Jackson was in it. Ann Francis, yep. who was hot. Yep. What a babe. And, and, and again, this was one of those moments where, because it wasn't a studio film, he had the opportunity to have more involvement because he was king, kind of king of the hill. I mean, he was the star star and uh, they asked, you know, his opinion and he, he sat in on the casting and he literally handpicked those three ladies. Well, so. they were pretty darn good and I enjoyed it very much. One of your father's performances I just saw, well, just, I'll say three months ago, 10,000 bedrooms and he played Anton and he was a, a very, um, humorous character. I thought he was adorable and funny and he was like a bad artist. And <laughs> he was just yeah. so good. I loved him. Just like so many people didn't realize how physical he was, what a good athlete he was. Yeah. They, they don't realize how funny he was. He had a great sense of humor. I think Wicked, I, actually. I love well, Wicked Sense of Humor. I think a lot yeah. of people have the misconception that your dad was very serious very yeah. no fun um, yeah. because he well, didn't he, he wasn't Mr. He was big, big Publicity dude you know he was, he was Victor and he was Jerry he was heroic and he was romantic and that's it uh -huh. and both of those roles are very serious roles both of those films it, the characters he plays in those two films are very serious big time especially people. in um, especially in Casablanca as the Nazi yeah. freedom fighter um, but he, but he, the person, was very funny. I, he had a good, again, he had a great sense of humor. He loved tricksters. His like Charlie Chaplin was a friend, yeah. and would go and visit with them in Switzerland and so on and so forth. And Charlie had a tennis court. And Charlie didn't like the pro who we thought was arrogant and obnoxious, which I think is hilarious coming from him. <laughs> but, he is something but, else. Yeah, completely something else. Yeah. He and my father got together and decided to, because, again, at the time, my sister was junior national champion here in the States, <laughs> and, and tiny. I mean, she's just this little tiny girl. And so Charlie decided what he was going to do. He was going to invite the tennis pro to come up to the house and then challenge him to this match. And obviously, the tennis pro would pick my father as his partner. Mm hmm Charlie and my sister beat the pants off this tennis pro. <laughs> Good for them. Made Charlie and my father very happy. <laughs> Sorry, you know. Um, I know. I read this funny quote about um, Charlie Chaplin. They said, "If people aren't sitting at his feet, he'll find where people are sitting and stand in front of them." <laughs> so true. <laughs> and I'm reading a book. I'm going to interview a guy who wrote um, a bio on Charlie Chaplin. So I'm. I'm reading that and I'll have him on because he's he's such a character um yeah, but but fascinating again fascinating yes I, totally. after dinner after dinner we go into the living room and and the, the girls would probably play guitar or piano or something and we sit around and talk and then the, before the children we the children would be in a different room or go out on the porch and the uh, grown-ups would stay in the in the main living room so I mean he was just he was fascinating such a raconteur such a amazing charm he had about him. Why did he get kicked uh, out of the, the States? Was that the blacklist as well? or? Well, it was sort of his version. It was, it was again, communist leanings vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. fighting. He didn't want to pay, or he didn't pay taxes or mm -hmm. something. I don't, again, when all of this was going on, I was a child. Yes. I, I wasn't even a teenager. I was a child child. So, a lot of these stories come after the fact to me. Right. A lot of these stories are, were conversations around the dinner table when I was growing up later. You know, and I did, luckily, even as an adult, stay close with my parents. So I did get to, you know, hear some pretty good stuff. <laughs> well, that's but, good. I'm glad you stayed yeah. friends with your parents because there's a, I mean, I, I do a lot of... Um, and Jessica, she uh, she was with her dad. Uh, her ex husband was on, and he was he was good. But <laughs> Jessica, I just love her, and now I love you, Monica. I think you're great. Oh, thank you. I do too. I love you. Are you going to go to 
has it happened yet? The thing down in Florida? Are you going to go to Key West again or Key Largo or wherever you guys go? We yes. Well, um, it was it it was the Humphrey Bogart Film Festival, right. but we didn't go last year. They they canceled it or postponed it. Maybe it'll happen this year. I don't know. I haven't heard. Did you like Stephen? I heard he's a character. Bogart. Stephen Bogart. Yeah. One of a kind. He's he's fabulous. That's what he seems to me. I saw him, he's Eddie fabulous. Muller, interview him, and yeah. I loved him. And, you know, he's got his mom's eyes. They say he looks so much like Bogey, but he's got those beautiful Lauren Bacall eyes. Yeah. Don't you think? You're right up next to him. Yeah, I don't, again, I don't, I don't see her in him because I don't, I don't pay attention to celebrities or movie stars or whatever have you like fans do. Ho hum, ho hum. It, next. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay, Monica. So, are you still shooting this? And when are we going to be? What about this documentary? When are we going to be oh, seeing this? Well, I wish I had an actual answer for that. But um, being the rather typical independent, underfunded documentary film. Um, we struggle to make it from uh, one section to another. We do have all the interviews on film. We do have 99.9% of anything else we want to shoot. Um, we do have, we know what clips we want to use. We know we have the, all the interviews. We have, like I just said that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically in post-production. I've been working on it. The, the biggest thing is, Excuse me. When you get to this point and you have accumulated so much information, I'm beginning to joke now because I used to say, "Okay, we'll make a five minute trailer <laughs> to raise to make to make to raise the money to make a 90 minute documentary." And now I feel that I need to raise the money to make a 90 minute documentary so that we can make a six part miniseries. Yeah, because <laughs> you have so much. You acquired so much. So much. There's so much information. Tell people and- where they can help. Um, Donate. I think you should have a distributor. Shame on you know. You think TCM or something because it's a good one. I loved your your TCM um, uh, honoring your dad. I thought that was really great. Thank you. Well, lest we get too far away from what you just said, we won't I would say that we do have a website which is Henry Beyond Laszlo. And once you get to the home page of that, there's a tab that says participate there's i mean there's lots of stories there's lots of pictures on the whole website but excuse me there is a tab that says participate and when you go we follow that you click on that tab it will take you to two ways to participate one is just you know basically with your credit card through paypal the other is through a nonprofit organization called from the heart and if you go through them Um, A lot of people who want to give more, a lot of money. I love them. Thank you so much. (laughs) Um, They they would like it as a tax-deductible donation. They can go through the link that goes through to From the Heart and donate that way. I'm going to link that up for you when I post this. And you also have a Paul Henry Facebook page. You're on Twitter. You're on. So um, just give me the – you can email me the Twitter and your – uh, Instagrams, what that is, okay. and I'll link that as well, and a link where people can uh, donate because I think it's going to be a fabulous documentary. And like I said, I I learned so much, I really did, and I'm reading. Like I said, I've been cramming to have, when I have you on to get to know things, and not everything is right. So I really love it, and I'm sure my my listeners will have will love this, and they will appreciate knowing the facts, just the facts, ma'am, as well. Just the facts, yeah. <laughs> and again, every, everything, because people always respond or always refer to Casablanca first, that is specifically why this is called Paul Henry Beyond Victor Laszlo. I love because that. It's really the story of his entire life, his entire career, and his contribution, because Aside from Rita Marino and Richard Dreyfus and Anne Francis, he boosted and started the careers of so many up and coming and then award winning actors. 
And it's fascinating because even though they don't tell the same stories, all these wonderful people who have participated in the film, right? that one thing they do have in common is how much they adored my father. And that is just... A wonderful tribute. What a tribute. Could you exactly. ask for anything better? Exactly. So um, send me uh, an email about all your other stuff, and I will link you up. And Monica, you were so great. I want to thank you so much for coming on. And when this doc, I'm going to donate, by the way. <laughs> but I'm not one of those rich donors, but I'm going to do something. And um, I... Count. Yeah. Counts. I appreciate everything wholeheartedly because, again, as we move through this, this type of documentary takes a very, very long time to make. It's uh, a slow-moving project, but but at the end, I think we'll all be happy that it was worth it. I think so, from what I've seen and what I've heard and what I know about your dad and you. I, I just think it's going to be fab. So Thank why you. don't you come back on when we get that documentary out there and okay. we'll toast each other with some champagne and say yay or wine or whatever okay so thank Thank you so much much. thanks monica i had such a nice time with you thank you thank you thank you bye-bye you must remember this a kiss is still a kiss a sigh is just a sigh the fundamental things apply as time goes by. And when two lovers woo, they still say I love you. All that you can rely. No matter what the future brings as time goes by Moonlight and love songs are never out of date Hearts full of passion jealousy and hate Woman needs man and man must have his made that no one can deny. It's still the same old story, a fight for love and glory, a case of do or die. The world will always welcome love. Time goes by Moonlight and love songs Are never out of date Hearts full of passion Jealousy and hate Woman needs man And man must have its mate That no one can deny it's still the same old story a fight for love and glory a case of do or die the world will always welcome